morning and welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship um, streaming live from the home of pastors Jan and Mike Osminski. Um, today I'm going to open up with Psalm 27. It's a very powerful psalm. I was feeling sort of discouraged yesterday and I think so was pastor and we both read this and it really um, moved us. So, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this, I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord. I don't know how many of us can say this. One thing. That I will seek this one thing. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord. To inquire in his temple. And for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. O oh God of my salvation, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do, do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breath out, I'm sorry, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now we're going to go right into our communion. So if you need to get your elements, please do so now. If you already have them, great. Um, this psalm is powerful. It's There's so many. You could just uh, speak hours, volumes on one line. I want to focus on a couple things. And I just something just popped out to me as I was reading. The very first scripture, the Lord is my light and my salvation. You know, in the very beginning in Genesis 1, and I referred this the other day. I'm going to go back to it. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was in the face of the deep, on the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. You see, we were like, when we first came to Christ, we were like that void. We, we had nothing. We were void. And he spoke light over us. And he separated the darkness from us. And we walked in light. For a long time, we walked in light. But I believe over the years, we have veered off the path. Most of us in the church, we have succumbed to things that we 
feel are more important than God. We have replaced him with things. And so we've allowed darkness to sneak back into our being. You know, I was listening to Allison um, and Rob, you know, do worship. And, and the songs are powerful. But do we compartmentalize everything? Do we sing the songs and not really pay attention to the words? Those are heavy words. Do we really focus on what we're singing? Do we mean what we're singing? Or is it just a song? It could be anything. Now skip down to uh, verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord for all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Well, first of all, can you imagine being so focused in your life that you just desire, you desire to be in awe of the Lord, to, to just, just to, to go into prayer and, and, and just seek his face? You know, prayer is, a, it's, it's a passionate time. When we go into our prayer closets, we're not just seeking answers. We're seeking the face of God. In our lives and if we're not then we need to um, prayer is meant to be a pursuit of a relationship with God yes we do have requests and he's more than willing to hear those but it's more than that we worship him we become one with him and you know and I'm gonna tell you the truth when some of us have been praying together and, 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 and some people pray, I feel the Holy Spirit. Their prayer is anointed. And I know it's because this has become a habit for them to seek God in their prayer time. It's not just once a week. It's daily. And that's how we should be, seeking his face. I have desired and I will seek his face. And you know what's interesting? David wants to go into the temple. The high priests were allowed in the temple. David wants to go in the temple. Nobody lived in the temple but God. Nobody lived, but David wants to live in there. He wants God to hide him in there and keep him safe in there. That's incredible. Do we say that, God? I want to be safe in you. I want to be safe in your temple. I, want to, I just want to be with you forever. It doesn't matter about anything else. And look at the last line. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Now turn with me to Matthew. Where is it? Matthew 5. Verse 14. Okay, actually, we can start with 13, but I, I really want to focus on 14. 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. See, salt's for the inner being. It, it was a preservative. It went deep into the meat. It went to preserve it from spoiling. It's for the inner. Let's go on. You are the you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Light is exterior. Light is what people can see. And when you think about it, if one little house is lit on a, on a, on a hill, you're going to see that one little light. But can you imagine if the whole church is lit up on that hill? It becomes a beacon of light for people. It becomes like um, like the light on your porch when all the flies or moss or whatever draw to it. It draws people. 
Now this is what I thought was interesting. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a light stand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are not to take the light and put a bushel over it. Now, a light has a function, a bushel has a function, and they're very different. A bushel holds grain, can hold all kinds of things, and a light is to show direction, it's a beam, it can give energy, it can give heat, but they're two different entities. And if I put that bushel that is meant for something else over the light, men cannot see it, no one can see the, the light leading people out of the darkness. And how many of us have taken a bushel that's needed? It's necessary. It's fine on its own. But it's not ever meant to cover the light. How many of us have taken a bushel? It could be our children. It could be our job. It could be a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whatever. That bushel represents to you, and we have put it over the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He is the light. So if you take that bushel and you put it over it, you distinguish any kind of guidance, direction for others, and you've also put the flame out in your own being. What about the lamp? Putting a bowl over a lamp. The bowl, well, in, in the Jewish homes, they had they didn't have candles back then. They had little lamps, and they'd pour oil in it, and they'd have the wick in the other end. They'd light it. Now, it's just one little lamp, but if they put it up on a lampstand, it, it glowed in the whole room. The whole room would have light. God wants us to stand up. God wants us to shine. Now, they put a bowl, it was a measuring bowl, over it when they wanted to extinguish the light. Are you putting measuring cups over your lamps? Are you putting the light out? See, I think as Christians, we've made choices. We've made choices. I like my bushel. I like it full of my children. I like it full of my family. I like it a little bit more than this light. Oh, this measuring cup? Yeah, I really like this. I really need it. I need it more. I need it on Thanksgiving when I'm going to visit family members that exceeds the limitations. You know, we have been told by numerous people it's unsafe. But yet I would bet you, there's some of you that are watching right now, that plan on going to huge gatherings. And I just want to say, when you do that, not only do you put yourself at risk, you put others at risk. You are taking the bushel and you're saying it's more important than the light. Let me say this, that we have so often chosen the bowl or the bushel. And it started out small. Maybe it started out as a tiny little basket. And now we have a bushel. And now we have, maybe it started out as a small measuring cup. And now we have a huge measuring cup. And we have distanced ourselves from the light. From who we are supposed to be. I am not supposed to compromise and be what my children want me to be. They're to join me. Do you understand? And I think so many Christians in this hour have, have changed it around. You know, someone said to me the other day that their son said to them, I lead by example. You know what? That is powerful. Lead by example. So if I say to people, I'm not gathering, I'm not gathering on Thanksgiving. When I say wear a mask and social distance, I do those things. You must lead by example. 
And in this hour, just by doing that, you are being a light in the world. You are saying something by your action to your children. No, I, I'm sorry. I want to live to fight another day. I want you to live to fight another day. And I am not gathering on Thanksgiving. I'll Zoom. I'll do whatever. We can eat on a Zoom call together. I don't care, but I will not do that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the tip of the iceberg. I feel that that there's been such good teaching coming out of this church. I really do. I think it's incredible. And people will say all the time, oh my gosh, the teaching is unbelievable from Pastor. But I'm not seeing I'm not seeing the fruit. I'm not seeing that people really listen. And I think that people compartmentalize. Today's church, I listen. Good word. And then I go about and do what I want. I sing the worship song, good song. I go about and do what I want. We need to bring the lights back on. We need to light those those candles. We need to shine. We need to gather. You know, our church is on a little hill. It's not a big hill, but it is a little hill. And I believe it stands out in our community. But do we stand out in our community? Do we even stand out in our own families? Are we making a difference? Or do we... Are we are we becoming like them? Are we changing for them? So that's been on my heart. And I, I really feel that um, I, I, just, I just want us to be the light. I want us as Jesus was the light. You know, Jesus never compromised. You know, when somebody said, well, so-and-so, my so-and-so died, I have to go to the funeral. He said, let the, you know, let other people deal with that. See, we have become so preoccupied in what we think our children want. I'm going to say it because that's a big part of it. And we succumb to their desires instead of the other way around. So in this hour... Do you have the courage to be the light? Do you have the courage to stand up? See, it's not about, I can say, I'll pray for you. I can say, oh, I'm going to cast that demon out of you. Whatever. That's not being Jesus. Jesus is making the hard decisions. It's making the hard choices. And for us in this hour, a hard choice might be for you. To not gather with your family. That might be a hard choice. So whatever it is you're facing, whatever the bushel is, you put over that light. You need to go before the Lord and ask him to reveal it. So now we're going to partake in communion. You know, in these words I spoke, I want to change. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be out there and be a light. I don't want to have to say things. I just want to, my actions, what I do, no gossip, no, no whatever it might be, no whatever. I don't want to do those things that would hurt Jesus. I don't want to do those things that Jesus would never in a million years do. Never. I want to change inside. I want to be that light. I want to be shining. You know, think about what, what is a light. It has so many different definitions. It's energy. It's heat. If we didn't have the sun, we wouldn't have food. Light sustains us. So today, when we partake, pray that you go before God. And you do what you need to do to restore the light back in your life. There's no light in some of your lives. It's gone. You might smile. You might say the right words. But the light is gone. So today, we're going to take the elements right now. Pastor, who is deep in prayer here, I can see. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm speaking these words to myself as well as to everybody watching. 
I want to be a light. I want to be a light in this dark world. I want to be a light to draw all men onto Jesus. I want to be the light that changes things. But I can't change anything if I'm not doing it. I can say the words, but I must act. So Jesus, we thank you that you acted and obeyed your father. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And the blood, the blood of Jesus. Oh, if we just think about how he suffered so. And yet we wouldn't suffer one iota by giving up something that is so precious to us, giving it up so Jesus could shine. I pray in this hour, Lord, you convict our hearts. You change us. You make us strong. You make us warriors in this hour strong being the light we're being selfish we're covering the light up we're not leading people to you in this hour so thank you lord for the blood thank you for the life thank you for doing what you needed to do and i pray again that we can follow your example in jesus name amen Thank you. Have a blessed day. I'm turning it over to Pastor. <laughs> He's coming with his um, stack of Bibles here. And I am moving out. Nice transition. Thank you for listening to me rant. God bless. Amen. So, I want to um, just deal with the Psalms today. Um, we are in the Psalms. We started over the Psalms again on day 300. It'll take us through Psalm 66 at the end of the year. We are currently uh, on Psalm 27 today, which is what Jan read. Now, we're in book one of the Psalms, which goes from Psalm 1 through 41. And that's the Genesis book, and it speaks of the origins of God's purposes in the nation of Israel. It speaks to new beginnings in the church. And it's, it's, it's the Davidic book of the Psalms. The majority of the Psalms uh, of 1 through 41 are Psalms of David. So we are really looking at how God began the kingdom purposes for Israel in the earth through the kingship of David. Now, normally each year, starting November 11th through December 12th, that's 11-11 through 12-12, that's a special time of the year for me. It's a time where I really seek revelation from the Lord for the upcoming year. And so um, in looking at the psalm that began on November 11th, which was Psalm 16, and running through December 12th, I'm really just seeking to see if the Lord is giving a consistent message uh, through psalms. So we're going to look at, uh, we're going to try to go through Psalm 16, at least through 26 and possibly uh, through to 27 and, and just look for a kind of a coherent message that, that David in, in the Psalms that are attributed to him is, is sharing about his kingship, his relationship with God and God's purposes. 
Remember, again, these psalms in book one speak of the Lord's establishment of David's kingship, David's reign, and David's house. Now, Psalm 16 begins with the inscription, a mik tom of David. Now, those terms that are, those Hebrew terms that are in the inscription of many psalms are debated, discussed uh, by different commentators, and there's a lot of speculation in terms of what those specific words mean. Most tend to think there's some kind of a musical direction. The Psalms were sung, the Psalms were prayed, and the Psalms were recited, uh, oftentimes recited antiphonally. A priest would say part of the Psalm, the people would respond, perhaps a prophetic oracle, a, a, a word of prophecy would be part of that particular Psalm. Uh, but but the, the Jewish commentators uh, looked at the Hebrew words uh, and, and tried to understand what those words mean. Now, miktam is a Hebrew word, and it comes from two Hebrew words, mek and tam. Mek means humble, and tam is the word, tamim is, is the word for blamelessness, integrity, perfection. But what tam really means is complete devotion to the Lord. It's a life immersed in the Lord and his word and his purposes and his presence. So miktam has to do with humility and has to do with complete devotion to the Lord. So if we're going to trace uh, this pattern of how David's kingship was established, how God uses origins to, to, to build his kingdom through his people, if we're looking for new beginnings for the church right now, I would say that this psalm suggests prophetically we need to walk in humility and we need to walk in complete devotion to the Lord. This is something that God wants of the church more than anything right now, humility. And we'll see a kind of a pattern in, in these psalms that we look at, uh, starting with Psalm 16. We'll kind of see that pattern and, and perhaps come to understand through the psalms what that means. Uh, this is what we must be to walk as kings of the Lord. We're called to be kings and priests of the Lord. We must walk in humility and walk in devotion to the Lord. Now, this particular psalm, Psalm 16, verses 3 and 4, speaks against syncretism. Now, syncretism it was, was the practice of idolatry in ancient Israel. We, I remind God's people of this constantly, that idolatry is not worshiping another God instead of the Lord. It's worshiping the Lord and another God. Jan was talking about we can worship the Lord and we can worship family. We can worship the Lord and we can worship our country. And David addresses syncretism in this particular psalm. The first verse says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Now, first of all, I'm going to read ESV says, as for the holy ones in the land, and the question is, who are the holy ones? That's not the normal term, chasidim, which refer to God's people as being holy because they walk in obedience to the Lord. They're committed to the steadfast love and the grace of the Lord. It's a different word. As to the holy ones in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Now, it is quite possible that the psalmist is speaking of, again, supernatural entities. And he refers to them as the excellent ones. He refers to them as the, as the um, holy ones, the notable ones. Because the next verse goes right into this. The sorrow of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. So it, it ties these particular holy ones in verse 3 with, with the shedding of innocent blood. Now, more than likely that refers to either worship of other kinds of deities or entities who demand blood sacrifice and 
David says, I won't partake in any of that. I won't even mention their, their, their names. I'll make no vows in the name of their gods. But the NET, the New English Translation, I want to read to you the way they translate verses 3 and 4, and they, they give us potentially another slant on this. 16.3 in the NET says, As for God's chosen people who are in the land and the leading officials I admired so much, their troubles multiply, they desire other gods. And it's talking now about notable people, leaders, rulers, people that, are, that you admire so much that can lead us into syncretistic idolatry, worship of political leaders, worship of notable people. We have to be careful. David says we, 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 we cannot fall into syncretism. The syncretism has to do with their, their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. And we've talked about the shedding of blood, whether it's the shedding of blood of, of babies in hospitals and abortion clinics, the shedding of the blood of the poor, the oppressed in the streets, the shedding of the blood of people by, by mishandling COVID-19, the shedding of blood by our willingly exposing others to COVID-19 when we ourselves are sick. This is, the shedding of blood, it has to expand in our understanding beyond what many Christians see it. They, 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 they see legitimately abortion as something wrong. They see violence and murder as wrong. But injustice from government officials that shed blood innocently. Injustice from far right and far left people who shed blood, the blood of the innocent. We, we, we need to understand this is syncretism. This is what David is saying, I will not partake of this. The psalm continues, verses 5 and 6 speak of the inheritance the Lord provides for those who seek his face. And of course, seeking the face of the Lord is, gonna, is, is, is a topic we're going to see frequently repeated in these psalms. The Lord has chosen my portion and my cup, verse 5 says, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. David says, but you're establishing the lines of inheritance for me. You're, you're giving me a generous portion in my cup. My lot, the lot that determined land for an ancient Jew, you've given these things to me generously. So we're contrasting syncretism with inheritance. And finally, of course, uh, David says uh, at the end in verse 11, you make me to know, number one, the path of life. Number two, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Number three, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is our inheritance. There's going to be a path of life, a way of life, the way of the Lord. That's how the church establishes new beginnings. That's how the people of God are established. That's how the kingdom of God is established, by following the ways of the Lord. His, he makes those known. That's revelation of his ways. His presence comes with us. He reveals his person to us, and it causes fullness of joy in our lives. And at his right hand, his right hand is his hand of strength and power. God's strength, God's power for God's purposes. Next, we go to the, the 17th Psalm. And the 17th Psalm, it's, it's a prayer of David. He cries out to be vindicated, but he cries out to be vindicated because he himself has sought after righteousness, the righteousness of the Lord, the justice of the Lord, the Lord's steadfast love. He has sought the face of the Lord, which we're gonna see repeated here, Psalm 27 talked about it. Jan quoted it, seeking the face of the Lord. He has purpose to be obedient to the Lord. David calls the Lord to deliver him. 
So in Psalm 17, he says, Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. My prayers are, are, are not dubious, duplicitous. I have simple prayers. I want to see your purposes accomplished in my life, Lord. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold righteousness. Now, the psalm starts, the prayer starts, he wants the Lord to look at him and see righteousness and look at how the psalm ends. The psalm ends, verse 13, Arise, O Lord. This is how the prayer ends. Confront my enemies, subdue my enemies, deliver my soul from the wicked ones by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children. They leave their abundance to their infants. Human beings, inheritances, I gain something of this world and I, 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 I leave something of the world forward to my children, as if that's the only purpose in life. But David says, he contrasts himself, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I want you to look and see my righteousness is where the prayer begins. It ends, I want to see your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. The 18th Psalm is a, is a long psalm, and we, we, we won't go through uh, all of it. We want to summarize it. The inscription says in Psalm 18 to the choir master, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, now this is actually a repetition of, of, of the prayer of David at the end of his life in 2 Samuel. Um, I, I, I believe it's 2 Samuel 22. And if, if you were to look up 2 Samuel 22, let me look it up for you. Uh, yeah, 2 Samuel 22 is almost word for word what this psalm is. They're, they're basically the same prayer. And it's David summarizing his life before he dies, before he uh, turns the, the work of the kingdom over to his son Solomon, and before Solomon builds the temple that David desired to build, and there's this, this summary statement of, of, of what the life of a, of a righteous king who's cried out in Psalm 16 and Psalm 17 to the Lord. And I'll summarize the main ideas without reading the psalm. The psalm begins, though I, I, I will read the, the first words of the psalm because they're powerful. I love you, O Lord, my strength. Now that's a word that the Lord usually uses for us. It's, it's rachamim. I love you, Lord. I, it, the Lord says that about us. It's his tender mercies. It's the, the, the tenderness the tender love and the tender compassion and tender mercies that a mother has for her baby child. The tender mercies of the Lord. But David directs it to the Lord. I love you in that same way, Lord. So the psalm begins with love and praise in verses 1 through 3, followed by a declaration of the Lord's deliverance of David in verses four through six, an appearance of the Lord in verses seven through 15, a theophany. In the middle of this, we, you always have a theophany. That is the Lord opening the heavens, rending the heavens, coming down and appearing to David, appearing to his people, appearing to, to his disciples after he was raised from the dead, appearing to Saul on the road to Damascus, appearing to John in Revelation 1, a theophany where the Lord rends the heavens and comes down. How the Lord delivers his people is he either brings us up into heaven, we're seated in heavenly places with him, or he opens the heavens and comes down and he's with us. And David is conscious of that in terms of his life story, the Lord appearing. 
Then there's a description of the process of deliverance in verses 16 through 19. David's declaration that he, David, has walked in righteousness in verses 20 through 24. Of the Lord's faithfulness to David in verses 25 through 31. And this is powerful. If you haven't already um, read this psalm, follow the, the, this outline. But then verses 32 through 45 is the description of how the Lord equips David for victory. How the Lord made him a mighty man, a warrior, one who overcame, one who got the victory. It's powerful to read because it speaks to us. God does these things with us to establish his kingdom and to make us kings and priests unto himself. And of course, it concludes with David's testimony of worship. Then we get to Psalm 19, which is uh, one of the more famous psalms. It's actually, we're, we read a group of very famous uh, psalms in this particular section. Psalm 19 speaks of the voice of the Lord. Psalm 19 begins this way, verse one, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day unto day pours out speech. That's the voice of the Lord. Psalm 19 then shows us as God is establishing the inheritance of his king, delivering his king, equipping his king, coming down from heaven to give his king victory over his enemies as he's establishing his kingdom to his king and his kings and priests, the Lord's voice is very significant. We must hear the voice of the Lord if his kingdom is going to be established in our life. Now, it's interesting, three aspects of the voice of the Lord Three aspects of revelation are covered in Psalm 19. Verses 1 through 6 speak of the heavens. It, it speaks of how God uses nature and creation to speak. The natural order is the voice of the Lord. We need to be able to look around us. The first place we need to hear God's voice is in circumstances. He is the Lord of nature. He's the Lord of creation. And he speaks through creation. He speaks through things that he does in the earth. And one of the questions I put here in my notes, and I, I, I sent some of these notes out to uh, for teaching out earlier in the week, concerning this first aspect of the Lord, what is the Lord speaking to us through the global pandemic? We need to hear his voice. We don't need to just you know, listen to what politicians say about the pandemic or, you know, somebody's opinion on the internet. We need to hear the voice of the Lord. What is God speaking to us in the pandemic? Because that's part of nature. I mean, th this is nature. This is under God's control. It's under God's authority. So we need to be able to hear God's voice in our circumstances. Second, and, and this I want to read, of course, we need to hear his voice and his word through scripture. 7 through 11 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is certain, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The just decrees of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, Scripture, the word of the Lord, is your servant warned. And in keeping them, there is great reward. Now, I, I really, I want you to see the different aspects of Scripture. This is how Scripture guides us. Scripture. We're not talking about an inner voice here. We're not talking about be, being led by the Spirit. We are, I say this every week. I'm going to continue to say it. We have come to a place where the Lord told me this or the Lord told me that is so, has been so ridiculously distorted that every thought that comes into my heart and mind, we say, 
the Lord led me. It has become the biggest excuse, the biggest cop-out for our doing anything we want. I've, I mean, I, I've been a charismatic all my life. I believe in prophecy. I believe in prophets. I believe in the voice of the Lord speaking. But I have gone full circle to where I dread it now when somebody says, well, the Lord led me. And, and people do anything in the name of the Lord led me. We have, just, just as this, like I've, I've said it before, just as this coronavirus, it's, it's easily transmittable. We have the easily transmitted aspect of false prophecy going on in the church right now. And here's false prophecy. The Lord told me. Well, the Lord told you has to be first from the written word. The Lord speaks through circumstances. He speaks through the written word. Here's what it says. The law of the Lord is perfect. That's the Torah, the written word of God. And the written word of God, the Torah is, in the Hebrew, it's tamim. The word of the Lord is blameless. The word of the Lord leads us to integrity. The word of the Lord is completely true. And what it does is it revives the soul. It causes the soul to return unto the Lord. We'll see that again in the 23rd Psalm. The testimony of the Lord is certain. The testimony of the Lord is God's word works in our lives and we get a testimony from submitting to the word, believing the word, and trusting the word. That's what the testimony of the word is. It, it creates testimonies in our lives that we can give glory to the Lord because of his word. And those testimonies, scripture says, it makes wise the simple. It gives us wisdom. The next are the precepts of the Lord are upright and they cause the heart to rejoice. Now the precepts of the Lord are, what that refers to is how, how basically, how basically the word of the Lord forms destiny within us. It forms destiny within us. So the precepts of the Lord bring a destiny forth in our lives. And the precepts of the Lord create that destiny. And what that does is the precepts of the Lord cause the heart to rejoice. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It gives revelation. God's commandments that we obey bring revelation to our eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's pure. And it endures forevermore. The fear of the Lord endures. And finally, the righteous judgments of the Lord are true. The justice of the Lord is true. And what that does, the justice of the Lord is true. And what the justice of the Lord does is they are righteous altogether. Now, the third voice of the Lord then spoken here is how the Lord communicates directly to his servants. That's why verse 11 says, Moreover, by them, by the word of the Lord, is your servant warned, keeping them as great reward. And as we hear the voice of the Lord in the written word, as we hear the voice of the Lord in the written word, then we begin to understand the word of the Lord in the spirit. But here's what's interesting about verses uh, 12 and 13. Who among us has discernment for our errors? See, this is where humility comes in. We err. We don't see clearly. We're not infallible. And we have to understand that's who we are. When scripture says we're sinners, it's not giving us a, a, an allowance to sin. It's saying that our perceptions are flawed. And it's, the, it's a rhetorical question. Who can discern his errors? No one can. No one can discern his errors. Declare me innocent from my fall, faults and flaws that are hidden from me. See, this is, it's the voice of the Lord. 
through circumstances, through the word of the Lord, it's the voice of the Lord that causes us to discern. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless. I shall be innocent of great transgression, great rebellion. Now notice it's contrasting the hidden sins, the things we do because we, we, don't, we don't understand with also the sins that we willfully commit. And the ones we willfully commit are called great transgression. We need to hear the voice of the Lord. We need humility and devotion to the Lord, as the Tom says. And then everything is concluded in verse 14. The psalm concludes with a cry that prays that these three sources of revelation will make our lives acceptable to the Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Let me hear your voice, and may I speak from the heart. May I hear your voice, and may your heart, may your voice discern that which is not of you in my heart. Then that brings us to Psalms 20 and 21. And Psalms 20 and 21 are, are very simply, Psalm 20 is a psalm. It's a prayer of the king before he goes into battle. Psalm 20, verse 1, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Verse 9, O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Before the king goes into battle, he cries out, it's a prayer, God grant the victory. And then Psalm 21 praises the Lord for giving the king the victory. Psalm 21, 1, O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. It's speaking of how the king rejoices because God has heard his prayer before he's gone into battle, given him the victory in the battle, and now he rejoices in that. Which, of course, brings us to Psalm 22. And, and it's, it's quite a contrast. There seems to be this upward trajectory, this upward trajectory in the psalm the victory of the king, the Lord watching over the king, the king, God protecting the king, the Lord bringing the victory to the king, the Lord establishing the inheritance, and then all of a sudden you have the psalm of Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, this psalm reminds us that kingly victories do not mean that we, as our Lord Jesus before us, are spared suffering by all of our God-given victories and in our obtaining our inheritance. It means that there will be setbacks. It means that there will be suffering. It means that there will be difficult times. We are not to suppose that difficult times somehow means God is not answering us. Suffering means God is not answering us. Even feeling forsaken by God does not mean that God is not with us. This is inserted in the middle of this triumph and victory to remind us that there's a kind of a back and forth reality of, of being human beings. It, Jesus is our model. I mean, the cross had to come before the crown, or shall we say the cross and the crown came together. We too will all pass through the cross in receiving our crown as kings of our God and as authentic disciples of the Lord. But the cry of forsakenness that we shall experience at times, and if, if, you, if we were to read this whole psalm through, and it's, it's my favorite psalm, and I've taught on it many times, but you're going to see that the first 21 verses 
there's this punctuation between God forsakenness and prayers to God and crying out to God that he's faithful. Verses one and two, verses six and eight, and verses 12 through 18 speak of suffering, pain, forsakenness, betrayal, absence of God, but yet it's punctuated by prayers that God is faithful and that God will deliver us in verses three through five, nine through 11, and 19 through 21. So I repeat that the cry of forsakenness that we shall experience is times this staccato effect back and forth. Oh my gosh, God's forsaken me. God is holy. God is righteous. God is awesome. Oh my gosh, my bones are sticking out. My jaw, uh, uh, my tongue cleaves to my jaw. I'm, I'm, I, people are bartering for my garments. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pain. I'm feeling spiritual warfare punctuated. But, but Lord, you, you, you're the one that I trust. You're the one that took me from my mother's womb, put me on my mother's breast, and caused me to say life is good when God is Lord. This staccato effect back and forth ultimately becomes a crescendo of praise. The psalmist, or Jesus on the cross, comes to this point in the midst of the cross, in the midst of suffering, in the midst of devastation, and cries out, and the turning point is verse 21, and then verses 22 through 31. The turning point is verse 21, which I want want you to note. And it ultimately becomes this crescendo of praise and worship to God who brings us into our inheritance, even as he raised Messiah from the dead and established him as king of the universe in verses 22 through 31. I want you to see this, though. Watch this. Go go with me to verse 21. Save me from the mouth of the lion. This is is in the middle of going back to the, the, this, just this being fiercely torn apart by the enemies of God and by suffering that this righteous sufferer is crying out. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen. Our ESV says, you have rescued me. Actually, it says in the Hebrew, you have answered me. And, and you know, for all the years, all the years that I have read Psalm 22, and I, you'd think I'd know everything about it. I've studied it in such depth. Um, I've studied it in such depth, but I saw something that I'd that I'd I'd never seen uh, before in this particular psalm this time, and it's this, and I'm I'm going to read again from the NET instead of the the ESV. Uh, depending on which translation you looked at, I looked at a few translations, and they're translated both ways. But there's this emphasis in the Hebrew. I mean, reading it in the Hebrew kind of helps. Uh, I saw this. This is how it, how it reads. Really, this transition from 2221 to 2222. Rescue me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns of the wild oxen. And then there's this pause. You have answered me. And that's what it says in the Hebrew. And then it goes on to this crescendo of praise. And I realize Jesus on the cross is my picture and he's crying out, why have you forsaken me? But you're a good God. But look at the suffering I'm going through. And of course, we know that Psalm 22 up to verse 21, it's like a picture of what was going on at the cross. Even the taunting of the enemies of this righteous sufferer in Psalm 22, the scribes and Pharisees, they pick up the words of this psalm and taunt Jesus while he's saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He's crying out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? All of this is going on, but then there comes this point and the Lord cries out, you have answered me. And see, this is a perfect picture of suffering. We go back and forth between where's God? My pain is too great. I know God is awesome. I know God is wonderful. I know God is powerful. I'm suffering. 
it's too great for me. I can't do this any longer. And then we come to a point, we have a breakthrough. You have answered me. See, we press through the alternating pain and praise, pain and prayer, but when God answers us, we get to verse 22, and verse 22 says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one. See, we might be afflicted and it looks like God has deserted us, but he doesn't desert us forever. He has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Now this is interesting because normally when I teach this psalm, I'm trying to teach it from the standpoint of Jesus on the cross, what Jesus was going through so that we can understand the purpose of suffering. We're to, we need to press through to God. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this psalm a little bit more in its, its, its context within the Psalter and, and its, its significance. Now, this is very significant because you have basically someone who's afflicted crying out to God, God answers, and then what happens is the, the, the worshiper now, the, the seeker of the Lord begins to praise the Lord and says, I will perform my vows before those who fear him. Now, what that was, was when your prayers were answered, you offered a peace offering. The peace offering was an offering, a declaration of thanksgiving to the Lord that God had heard your prayer. Now, the peace offering is very interesting. It was burnt on the altar, and it's the only offering of all the offerings in the Old Testament that after it was burnt, a communal meal took place and all the worshipers gathered together and partook of that animal that was offered as a peace offering. And so the picture is this. It's, it's a picture that says when God delivers one of his people, that person bears testimony of his deliverance to everyone else and everybody else gathers in a communal meal and celebrates. But while, while the offering was being roasted before the meal, now the, the supplicant, the, the one who had prayed to the Lord and was answered, gave testimony to the people of what God had done for him or her. And that's performing the vows, offering the sacrifice. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. We're all coming now to this communal meal. We're all afflicted. And when God delivers one, see, when, 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 when one sorrow all sorrow. When one rejoices, all rejoice. And they who seek the Lord shall praise the Lord. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. This is this communal meal that's taking place when God answers suffering. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. And now we begin to understand God establishes his kingdom as his saints persevere, as his people persevere through suffering, continue to worship him, continue to focus on him, continue to cry out until they say, God has answered. And then it becomes a testimony that the nations hear and it draws the nations to the Lord. And, and look who's gonna come. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. God's going to deliver the prosperous. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, the prosperous, those who are dying, even one who could not keep himself alive, the poor, the broken, the helpless, all gather together through the testimony of God's people that the Lord is faithful and they come to the Lord and they're healed and they're delivered. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. And not only will those people who are alive come to the Lord through the testimony of the, the sufferer who was delivered, 
This is called, this psalm is often called a liturgy for one facing death. Not only shall the one who's facing death be delivered and many shall see and many shall fear and many shall put their trust in the Lord, but even unborn children, a second generation will hear this or perhaps born children who are young, the inheritance of their parents will be passed on down to them. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. And then we come next to the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as Brother Neil Silverberg has often said, there are four words in that first part of, well, in verse one, it says, Yahweh shepherd, no lack. Four words. Yahweh is my shepherd. There is nothing lacking. And notice there's no object to the verb nothing lacking. Uh, Nothing lacking for what? Nothing lacking for every and any need that you can fill in there when Yahweh is your shepherd. And see, this is the powerful thing about David. David knew that he would only be established as the shepherd of God's people by looking to Yahweh, the true shepherd. Now, this psalm is divided in in half. It's divided, the first half of the psalm talks about Yahweh. The second half of the psalm speaks directly to Yahweh. It says that we may know about the Lord, but God, as our shepherd, he wants us to know about his faithfulness, but he wants to bring us into a personal relationship with him. The second thing is, it starts out the Lord as the shepherd. The second part of the psalm is the Lord as the host of the banquet. So we could call this, the Lord is my shepherd. It could be subtitled, the Lord is my banqueting host. So what does it mean that we shall not want and the Lord is our shepherd? He will bring us to green pastures. Pastures where we can flourish. Pastures where we can pastures where we can eat to the full. He leads me beside waters of rest. We will come to places of rest. To be in a place of rest means that our, our, our enemies are far from us. We are in a place where we're safe. God feeds as shepherd. God protects as shepherd. He, he leads us beside the waters of rest. He restores our soul. The word restoration can also mean return. It can also mean repentance. He restores us by returning us to a, a, a place of where, where we have no wants, no needs because we're in his presence and it's a place of repentance as well. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The paths of righteousness are paths where he delivers us from our enemies. Remember, God's righteousness is something that he imparts to us. God's righteousness is something he works into us. But God's righteousness is also the fact that he delivers us through difficult circumstances. See Psalm 22, he delivers us through those circumstances because he is our shepherd. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. His reputation is on the line. The Lord's reputation is on the line. He leads us because he is the shepherd and as the shepherd, he cares for his sheep. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's the valley of deep darkness which can also be translated the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Fear no evil means I I do not fear that something injurious to me and my life will take place. And then it goes from talking about the Lord to speaking directly to the Lord. For you are with me. He's with Abraham. He's with Jacob to establish their inheritance. He's with Jeremiah to establish his prophetic ministry. These are all people that the Lord said throughout scripture, I'm with you. In in 2 Isaiah 40 through 66, he's with the exiles of Israel who are going to return and rebuild the land. In Haggai, he's there for their return from exile, their rebuilding of the temple and their rebuilding the city. I am with you. In the New Testament, He says, 
His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us in the Gospel of Matthew. And when he's raised from the dead and he appears to his disciples on the mountain in Matthew 28, he says, Lo, I am with you always. Behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And then he tells Paul he's with him when Paul is in danger in a city and and God has a purpose for him to carry out. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Rod to beat off the enemy's staff to lead the sheep. And they comfort me, but really the Hebrew word there is they make me courageous. Your shepherding of me makes me courageous. And then the Lord turns into the banqueting host. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Will the Lord prepare a table in the wilderness? Yes, he will. He brings his sons and daughters out of Egypt and prepares a banquet for them as they wander through the wilderness into their inheritance. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The cup that that David said in Psalm 16 is, is overflowing. The Lord overflows it in the 23rd Psalm. Surely goodness and steadfast love will pursue me. The Hebrew says, they'll run after me. We can't, we can't escape God's goodness and his steadfast love all the days of my life. And I shall return to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then the remaining Psalms, we've just got a few minutes to, to look at them. 24 through 27, deal with being in the house of the Lord because I shall return to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the, the, the word return to dwell means that even when I get away from dwelling in the house of the Lord, I'm going to return to dwell in that house. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. God is the Lord of all creation. Well, how do we deal on earth? How do we deal with a God who's the God of the cosmos? How do we deal on earth with the Lord? Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? All right, you're going to return to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? And again, it, brethren, God imputes his righteousness to us. By faith in the blood of Jesus, we stand right before the Lord. But that's not all that God does. He imparts his righteousness to us. That that imputed righteousness, which is justification, becomes imparted righteousness in sanctification. It transforms our lives. It's awesome to say, I'm righteous by the blood of the Lamb. When I sin, I need to remember, I'm righteous by the blood of the Lamb. But there's there's an imparted righteousness that begins to transform our lives. And what the Lord is saying is, if you want to return, if you want to stay, if you want to dwell in the house of the Lord, it always comes back to righteous living. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to falsehood, who does not swear deceitfully. He talks about clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands is what I do. Pure heart is integrity from within my heart. My heart is transformed. He talks about not taking the name of the Lord in vain. In other words, if the Lord's name is named over us, then we need to live as if we are the people of the Lord. Because as my wife said last week, when when she's with her students in class, in her fifth grade class, she's Jesus to those students. She may be the only Jesus to that student. We Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. We live out what God has put into us. We live it out. And the second thing is, we do not swear deceitfully. We don't bear false witness. We don't speak lies about our neighbors, and we don't transmit lies to our neighbors. Please be careful in all the nonsense and the false prophecy that's going on right now. If you take something false into your mouth and then you share that with somebody else, you're bearing false witness against your neighbor. This person, this person who says, I am righteous by the blood of the lamb and I'm gonna live as if I'm righteous by the blood of the lamb, 
he will receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his deliverance. Salvation is deliverance in the Hebrew. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. And see, now we're, we're going to this whole section about seeking the face of the Lord. Very interesting. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, and the king of glory may come in. It's talking about the gates and the entrances to the temple. If the Lord, who's the, the master of the universe, is going to come down to the earth, the very gates, the lintels of the gates have to be, expand to, to, for the Lord to go through. The entrances have to expand for the Lord to go through them, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? He's a warrior, first of all. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Now, he's not just the Lord of battles. He's the Lord of the universe. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of the heavenly host. He's the king of glory. Now, this is a powerful prophetic metaphor. If the, if the gateposts have to be expanded for the Lord to come in, if they have to be widened for God to come in. It's speaking of us internally. We have to lift up our heads. We have to stretch the wineskins of our heart, open the gates of our heart for for the Lord to come in. We need to be stretched. We need to, to walk in way, 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 way more faith. And then when we get to that level, let's do even more faith. This is talking about an inner consciousness that allows the Lord to come in. And how do, do we establish that inner consciousness? This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek his face. Now, Psalm 25 is going to tell us how to stretch those inner gateways, those inner entrances. Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Now, shame. We have to understand what shame is. Do we understand when the psalmist, when the prophet, when the disciples cry out that we would not be ashamed? See, see we've turned shame into this kind of this kind of inner bad feeling that we have about ourselves. That's not what shame is. Shame has to do with not fulfilling the purposes that the Lord has ordained for us as kings, as disciples, as apostles, as prophets, as the church, as the body of Christ. Shame means that I do not fulfill the purposes God has ordained for me. That feeling, that inner feeling that says something is wrong, something's shameful, has nothing to do with somebody putting something on you from the outside. It's something on the inside that says, Lord, don't let what the enemies are trying to do to stop your purposes being fulfilled in my life, in my church, in my family, in my marriage. That's shame. We're saying, Lord, don't let it be so. Let them be ashamed. See, this is how we expand our consciousness. We are motivated by his purposes, destiny for us. And here's how you do it. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. See, we talked about that. Make the, the path of life. In Psalm 16, the ways of the Lord. As we understand the ways of the Lord, our inner consciousness opens up for the Lord to come in in glory and establish his purposes in our life. This is Genesis. This is new beginnings for the church. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Now, there's, there's this, this issue, too, about waiting on the Lord. Remember, waiting on the Lord, hoping in the Lord, trusting in the Lord, same concept in Hebrew. We wait on the Lord, we're trusting him. We hope in the Lord, we're trusting him. And we hope through conflict, 
through suffering, through difficulties. That's what trust is. The difference between trust and faith in the Old Testament is the difference between faith and hope in the New Testament. So there's going to be, this is how the inner consciousness changes. We walk in his ways and in his paths and the language of trust begins to emerge. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love. They've been for us from of old. Now notice it says, remember your mercy, your steadfast love. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. Remember your mercy and steadfast love. Remember me. Don't remember the sins of my youth, which are sins of foolishness. Young believers, sins of foolishness. Older believers, not sins of foolishness anymore, sins of rebellion. But God, don't remember rebellion. So you younger believers, when you look at older believers and say, you know, there's something wrong with those people. There is something wrong. It's called intentional sin. And older believers, when you look at younger believers, it isn't always intentional sin. See, we impute intentional sin to younger believers because we're struggling with intentional sin. See, there comes a time in life where you ought to know better than that. You ought to know better than that. But both are covered here. The Lord says, don't remember the sins of youthful foolishness. Don't remember the sins of older rebellion, Lord. For the sake of your goodness, do this, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and truth, faithfulness. For those who keep his covenant and his testimony, this is how we expand. And I'm, 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 I'm getting ready to uh, run out of power here. So let's, uh, let's finish up. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Powerful words. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him the Lord will instruct in the way that he, the Lord, should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being. His offspring shall inherit the land. There's our inheritance. And then here's the key verse to the 25th, to 25th Psalm. The secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him. The secret counsel is the sod in Hebrew. It's God's cabinet. Now, you know what the president speaks in his cabinet with his cabinet members. That's not necessarily open for public dispensation. Everybody's going to hear what's going on. That's for his advisors. The secret counsel of the Lord. See, this is a prophetic place. This is real prophecy. Real prophecy is to stand in the counsel of the Lord. Jeremiah 23 says the false prophets, they don't stand in the counsel of the Lord. The true prophets do. The false prophets live in fantasy. They make things up in their head and say, the Lord has declared thus and so to them when the Lord has not. That's why I said, please, we've got to become smart, church, and not listen to nonsense. The real prophetic trajectory in the body of Christ are those who stand in the secret counsel of the Lord. And the secret counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him, and the Lord makes known to them his covenant. In, in, in one translation of so, it is the friendship of the Lord. So you remember when Jesus said, I call you no longer servants but friends? For servant does not know what his master is doing, but I call you friends because everything that I'm doing, I'm revealing it to you. See, that's, that's what the, Jesus drew that from Psalm 25. And we need to come into that place where we're the friends of the Lord and we hear his secret counsel. The psalm continues. Psalm 26 then says, and this, this, is, this is, if we don't get to Psalm 27 today, that's okay. Pastor Jan already covered it, and I don't think we're going to get to it, except for one verse. This is what we should be praying right now in this hour. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my wholehearted devotion to you. That's what integrity is, tamim. For I have walked in my integrity my wholehearted devotion to you, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. We need to pray, judge me. We need to pray, prove me, O Lord. Try me. Test my conscience and my heart. 
for your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in your faithfulness. See, it's not good enough to walk around saying this person's deceived and that person's deceived. We need to wake up every morning and say, Lord, I'm deceived. Show me, Lord. Judge me, Lord. Examine me. Test me, Lord. Try me. See if there, see what's in my heart that is not consistent with you. This is how you expand the, the inner door. Is it's through humility and devotion to the Lord. And see, humility is not, I hear God and the rest of you don't. Humility is we, like Daniel prays, we have sinned. He doesn't say, oh yeah, all the rest of these idiots have sinned and I'm your, your special prophet, I haven't. This is where we need to come. And finally, Psalm 27, and we will quote one verse, and Jan talked about it. One thing have I asked of the Lord, verse 4 in 27, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. See, remember, I will return to dwell in the house of the Lord, Psalm 23. I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I'm going to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, the splendor of the glory. See, gazing on the beauty of the Lord. Gazing on the beauty of the Lord. Seeking means I'm, I'm putting every bit of effort in my life to understand who God is and what his will is. And I understand who he is when I gaze upon his beauty and I understand his will when I inquire in his temple. To inquire in the temple of the Lord means... I seek deep understanding and discernment about the will of the Lord. Father, in this hour, we desire to become kings. We desire to become like David. We desire to get our inheritance. We de desire a new beginning in the church. Father, we need to seek after you with all our heart, soul, and strength. We need to repent, Lord. We need to ask you to judge us, to examine us, to test us, to try us. We need to walk in hopeful, waiting trust, Lord. We need to see our inner man stretched so the king of glory can come in. And we understand, Lord, we need to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As Jan said today, who dwells in the house of the Lord forever? Not even the priests dwell forever. But see, Lord, it isn't that we go necessarily where you are and stay there forever. We go where you are, we see you, we inquire, and then we take you with us when we go out into the earth, Father. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to stand in the counsel of the Lord, to be in the intimate friendship of the Lord in this hour more than ever. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.